Thank you so much, Dana and Rebecca, for having me to Aut Autism Tree Project Foundation for this Lunch and Learn. I'm really excited to be with everybody. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Um, so I want to tell you, just give you a little bit of background about what I'm going to be talking about today and, and why I'm doing the research that I am doing. So I, like probably some of you, um, I am a mother, a parent of an adult with autism, and um, he, my son has really inspired me to learn as much as I can, and being a physician, I... Um, wanted to understand more. And I was very concerned about uh, things that we could potentially do to help families that maybe didn't get a, a, as much attention in the research community as uh, perhaps would be helpful. So um, I'm currently at Drexel University in the Department of Psychiatry, and I do uh, research on early childhood development and modifiable exposures. And I'll explain to you what that means. So the things that we look at are early experiences in a child's life that could potentially help their development. Um, and some of those factors that have been associated, I'm going to show you the research and how these factors are associated with child development, are um, social experiences and audiovisual experiences. So social experiences are very important early on because they help the brain to develop the connectivity to, um, to foster the social development of the child. And the screen media is important as it has been shown to have some association with developmental delays in various areas. So when I'm talking about audiovisual media, I'm talking about television, video, mobile apps, and electronic toys, but not video chatting. So these are pre-recorded shows or movies that, and, and I'm talking about exposure in the first year or two of life. So not for later children, this doesn't apply, but I'm talking about in the earliest time frame, the first year, first three years of life, but really the first two years of life, um, it, it, a lot of this research will be related to. Um, so when we talk about uh, these audiovisual you know, exposures, such as watching a television show or a movie um, in the very youngest children, we, we just want to remember that the show isn't responsive to the child. The show doesn't change based on what the child is doing. Video chatting with friends or relatives is completely different and considered in a different category because it, the person, so if a grandmother is video chatting with, with, a, with a baby or a two-year-old, the grandmother is very attentive to the baby and responding and smiling or perhaps talking about what the baby is looking at. And the, the grandmother would behave very differently if the baby was crying or laughing or smiling, whereas a pre-recorded program, the characters on that program do not behave any differently depending on the response of the, the baby or the child. So early television and um, screen viewing has been associated with some developmental delays. And these areas are particularly in language delay. So um, in language delay, uh, one of the studies looked at infants 8 to 16 months old and found that each hour of screen viewing, in including background television, is associated with a 17-point decrease in communicative development. And mobile devices have also been associated with developmental delay. Um, and uh, in six-month-old to two-year-olds, each 30 minutes of, of use with a mobile device is associated with an increased 49% risk of expressive language delay. Early screen viewing is also associated with attention problems such as ADHD, and Christakis found that sc screen viewing, more screen viewing at one year of age and three years of age was associated with developing more attention problems by age seven. Additionally, um, exposure to TV and other media at six months of age is associated with cognitive um, delays at 14 months of age. 
behavioral problems such as um, emotional reactivity, aggression, externalizing behaviors, and oppositional defiance um, are also associated with early sc screen use. Um, so autism spectrum disorder has also been associated with increased screen viewing in young children. There was a study done um, in 2011 where they found that children with aut that had a diagnosis of autism had on average watched about four hours of screens in the first year of life, um, whereas children with without autism spectrum disorder had watched significantly less. And also the the age of onset of viewing in children with autism spectrum disorder was about six months compared to 12 months with children with typical development. So um, when we talk about these um, experiences that could potentially could be associated with developmental delays or with helping development, we want to kind of explain how the brain develops. So at birth, a baby's brain is about one, si one third the size of an adult brain. So the, the brain develops through the connectivity of the neurons. And that's how, that's what determines how the child will behave. But autism is highly genetically determined, as I'm sure all of you know and understand. It's about 50 to 80 percent genetically determined. And if we talk about syndromes, they're 100 percent genetically determined, because if you have that syndrome, you're going to have those symptoms, and some of those symptoms may be autism-like symptoms. But most of autism is not syndromic, most people that have autism don't have an actual syndrome. They may have genetic predisposition. So again, this 50 to 80%, but it doesn't 100% determine that any individual will develop autism, just that they're more likely to. So what we are trying to understand, are there other factors in the environment which are potentially modifiable, meaning that with helping parents to understand these factors and how they could maybe um, help the child develop that these that this part of development could be sort of helped and that could potentially positively impact the outcome in children that are genetically at risk for developing autism. So this experience dependent brain development means that the brain connections are formed related to the sensations that the baby is experiencing. So what the baby is seeing, hearing, feeling, um, touching, um, tasting, these, that's the way the brain develops the connections and then that determines behavior. So social factors such as people and their eyes, voices, and smiles, they respond to a young child and they would likely promote development of social brain pathways. But non-social factors such as screens and electronic toys, they don't respond socially to a baby. So they would, they do affect brain development, but they were, are not likely to help in the social pathways. And they may actually sort of jumpstart the, the sensory development. And, and that relates to also um, sensory development in autism, which I'll get to a little bit later. So again, autism spectrum disorder is highly genetically determined, but there are environmental non-genetic factors that have been associated with autism. And some of these factors would be very hard to change, such as the age of the mother, the age of the father, if the baby was premature, pollution, maternal depression, prenatal infections, medications, um, uh, birth complications and gestational diabetes are all factors which have been associated with autism. Um, but then modifiable environmental factors that have been associated with child development include the, the child's social experiences and the child's screen experiences. So these early experiences may potentially impact the child's early brain development and impact behavior. So first I wanna go over some parent-child interactions that predict positive developmental outcomes. And the reason I wanna discuss these is that there have been some studies that show that um, enhancing the social environment can perhaps uh, help children with autism to have better outcomes or children that are at risk for uh, autism, but particularly because screen viewing interferes with really important 
social environment, these really important parent-child interactions that predict positive child development. So parent responsiveness to the child. So when, when a baby is cooing or babbling and the parent may imitate back or may smile or gently um, touch the baby or um, has you know, some type of response may re repeat what the child is saying. And it's kind of like a back and forth. That's responsiveness to the child. And that's associated with greater language, cognitive and social outcomes. So that the parent responsiveness to the child in the first year or two of life predicts to some degree the, the outcome in these uh, important developmental factors. Verbal stimulation, such as talking to the child about what the child is doing, seeing, feeling, what the child is experiencing, um, has, uh, is associated with positive language and cognitive development, and the parent involvement in toy play is associated with positive social and language development. So these are parent-child interactions that predict positive um, outcomes. So, but background and child-directed TV um, and other screens, they interfere with these really important social experiences. And a lot of people don't realize that. And our world has changed so much because there are screens available, multiple screens at a time, sometimes available um, and on, you know, at, at home with, with a, a young baby or, you know, child. Um, so one study looked at parent responsiveness to the child and they found that um, it, when the screen they, they had the parents pick a, a television program and the, the program was on for 30 minutes and off for 30 minutes. And they, they found when the program was on that parents did not respond as much to young children. And this was in children 12, 24, and 36 months. And that they, there, was less, um, there was less eye contact. There was less, um, less speaking to the children. And the parents played less with the children when the screens were on. Um, there was another study that looked at when uh, screens are on in the background, so they had a listening device and that could tell the difference between a pre-recorded video um, voice and a real person in the room, and they found that when audible television was on that parents talk less and children talk less, and this was done in children 2 to 48 months of age, and Another study looked at when child-directed or baby-directed television is on, was on for 10 minutes and off for 10 minutes, that, again, the parents engaged less with children when the screens were on, and they played less with children when the screens were on. And also mobile devices, whether it's a child using mobile device or a parent using mobile device, can also disrupt these really important social experiences. Um, Jenny Radeski did a, a, a research study where she looked at dyads, parent-child dyads in fast food, food restaurants, and she found that when a parent was on their mobile device that they tended to not be responsive to their child. They didn't have eye contact with the child. They tended to respond harshly, like with harsh words and occasionally even a, a push or, or a, a kick um, be, because they were being sort of interrupted from something that may have been important to them. So if young children are um, spending a lot of time on screens and they're disrupted from having the social experience, of, but aren't they learning from the television? Don't learn, young children learn? And what would they be um, you know, losing if we kind of turned off the TV and, and place more time on the social? Well, young children don't learn well from television and video. It's been termed the video deficit. So in areas such as imitation, if uh, young children, this was on 12, 15, and 18-month-old children, and they were shown to imitate something on a toy, and they were, sh they were shown to do something on a toy, and then they, they uh, tested them to see if they could imitate. The same exact thing was done in person or on video, and if, if they were shown by a person in the room, they could imitate, but when the same exact thing was shown on video, which represented the room, they couldn't imitate. Same thing with finding hidden objects, whether the object is actually hidden in front of the child, so they're seeing the object being hidden, or the child is told where the object is hidden. And these, this was in two-year-old children. If 
that if the person doing the telling or the hiding is in the room with the child, the, the two-year-old can find the hidden object. But when the same thing is shown to them reflecting the room, um, but it's shown on video, they can't find the object. And similar findings in learning language. And this has been shown in second le language learning, even in infants, that infants can learn the sounds of the phonetics of a second uh, language if a real person is talking with them in the room, but not if it's just on video or on audio. So what predicts learning? What is this um, deficit in video? Um, you actually have to have that joint attention for the youngest children to benefit and learn. So the joint attention is when the child can look back and forth between the adult's eyes and the object of interest, that's joint attention. So I just want to review another recent study, um, which relates to the research that I'm going to be talking about in a minute, our research. Um, there was a study done um, out of Australia, published in 2021, and they looked at siblings of children that have autism. And these were children at uh, 12 months of age that had early autism symptoms. And half of the children were in a group where the parents were given training. So children who have early autism symptoms, they may not, they don't generally have the same obvious social bids for attention. So they may not be as clear that they're trying to sort of communicate. So they trained the parents based on video of their own children how to, how, how to recognize their children's social communication and how to respond to that. And what they found, which was striking, was that in the, the group that had the training, the children had better outcomes. So less, they were less likely to actually go on to a diagnosis of autism, even though they all had early autism symptoms. So early experience does matter in autism. So by in increasing awareness for future generations, it may impact, it may be able to improve outcomes if, um, ch if children are genetically at risk. So I also just want to mention that in when we look at the brains in autism compared to typical development there and, and abilities, people with autism in general, again, these are all studies that have shown in general, people with autism tend to have greater visual abilities to spot a target visually, to spot, to tell if something's moving. So that's also a visual ability and better pitch perceptions. So that's an auditory of the ability. But these better abilities are sometimes tied to worse autism symptoms. So the brain findings in autism seem to be related, some of these sensory findings seem to be related to worse autism. There's also um, some sort of atypical sensory wiring that may interfere with social learning. So in typical development, people generally pay attention to the movement of people and animals, people's faces, social things. But in, in a one study, it showed that children with autism, they what determined their attention was audio-visually determined. So when a sound change and an image change, so audio-visual synchrony determined where they looked. And that's not really seen through the animal kingdom. So the concern is that if, if the brain is highly wired already in the audiovisual pathways, that greater audiovisual experiences or stimulation may further wire the brain in that way, and that may not be helpful to the to the social pathways. Another study that um, was done showed that the earliest findings in autism are there's a, a surface hyperexpansion in the visual areas at six to 12 months of age, and that uh, predicts further altered trajectory of development and development of autism. Um, so this is why we went on to study some of these things there because screens have been associated with developmental delays and the delays that I mentioned are all seen commonly in autism. Um, but screen media distracts the child from paying attention to people and it distracts parents and caregivers from paying attention to the child and it potentially may directly affect brain connectivity 
or affect attention mechanisms. So the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends no screen viewing before 18 to 24 months of age and no more than one hour daily through age five. So we looked at, we asked the question, are early media and social media exposure and social engagement associated with later autism symptoms? We used data from the National Children's Study and it, the National Children's Study was planned to be a very large study of environmental and, and genetic exposures um, on health in the US. And they were supposed to recruit 100,000 subjects and follow them to age 21. But because of recruitment challenges and other questions about the, the goals of the study, it was actually stopped abruptly and they only recruited 5,600 children. So we used what data we had from that study to, uh, to answer these questions. Is TV, DVD exposure associated with later autism symptoms? So at 12 months in the National Children's Study, they asked the question, does your child watch TV and DVDs? And 65% res had responded yes. Again, we didn't collect the data, we just analyzed the data. We also looked at 18 month data of how much time a child watched screens over the past 30, uh, each day over the past 30 days. And it was coded as three hours or less or four hours or more. And this was based on a study that showed that four hours of screen time was commonly seen in children in this one study that had autism. Um, we also asked about social experience and did that have any uh, association with later autism symptoms? And we looked at play at 12 months. How often do you play with toys with your child, daily or less than daily? And reading to child, how often does participant read to read or look at books with a child? And that was coded uh, by frequency of how many days a week. And then the outcome, what we looked at autism-like symptoms at 26 months. So because the National Children's Study was abruptly dis uh, stopped, um, we couldn't follow to actual outcome of autism. So again, we use a, um, it, it's, it's a, a test that looks for autism symptoms, so the MCHAT. And then we also looked at things that I mentioned before that are associated, some of these are associated with increased risk of autism, such as the uh, gestational age of uh, at birth, uh, the mother's age, the um, household income, race, ethnicity. And because immigrant status has been also associated with autism, we looked at whether the, the family was primarily English speaking or non-English speaking. Um, and then we, we were able to include in, in our study over 2,000 children at, who had had the MCHAT prior to the discontinuation of the study. And then we looked at just to review at 12 months, the screen exposure and the play and reading and an 18 month screen exposure. And then the outcome was at 26 months. And what we found was that less than daily play, fre play frequency at 12 months was associated with an 8.9 increase in MCHAT scores. So autism like symptoms. And also at 12 months screen exposure was, ex was associated with a 4.2 increase in MCHAT scores. Um, the screen exposure at 18 months was associated with a 10.7 increase, but because there were so few people in the, so, so few children in the four hours or more, it didn't reach statistical significance and reading was not a significant predictor. So this was, this was a, a, a po positive study because it showed things that really hadn't been looked at before. Um, it was prospective study. It assessed screen exposure relatively early. It was a relatively large study, but it was limited because it was an association or correlational study. The, the measures that we used were limited by what they had asked in the, um, in the National Children's Study. And the MCHAT is a, not a comprehensive diagnostic evaluation. There was another study that then sort of uh, was a, went a further step in looking at this. And they, it was a very large study out of Japan. They had over 84,000 mother-child uh, dyads and they looked at screen exposure 
at one year of life by the mother's report. And then their outcome was by three years, has your, ever, has your child ever been diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder? And what they found was that screen viewing of two to four hours a day was associated with three and a half times increased risk of developing autism by age three. So they did find an association when they considered boys and girls together, but when they separated boys and girls, it was significant for boys, but not significant for girls. Okay, and then I'm just going to mention a couple intervention studies, um, and then we'll open it up for discussion. So uh, a Romanian uh, scientist looked at 110 children with a diagnosis of autism. And then he split up the group according to if they had had that exposure of screens to four hours or more, or they did not have that exposure. And then the children that had the, ex and they found 75% of children diagnosed with autism in this group um, had had the exposure. And then they asked the parents to remove the screens, and then they did a lot of social intervention, which is typically done with children with autism spectrum disorder. So this was, they had their speech, their, if they needed an occupational therapy, they had ABA, and, but was high focus on social interaction. And they found that the children that had the high exposure to screens, a, short, a shorter treatment time was needed to get to their optimum outcome. They let, used less total therapy and autism symptoms improved more significantly than in the children that did not have the exposure. And when they looked at how many children had this history of high exposure to screens in the, in the children that were diagnosed in 2012, only 37% had the screen exposure four hours or more a day. But by 2017, 97% of children diagnosed with autism had the high screen exposure. And there was another intervention study that was done on children with autism symptoms, although without a diagnosis. And they found that when they had, wait, they asked the parents to turn off the screens and they used a focused play intervention was highly socially oriented, that the behavior, the, the repetitive behaviors decreased and also the atypical EEG pattern improved. So going forward, can we potentially help children at risk through studying these factors and, and potentially informing families that, that through changing the child's early experiences, they may potentially be able to improve outcomes in children at risk for autism. So we recommend going forward that a large controlled trial of an intervention, looking at how parents are implementing the intervention would be helpful. We'd also recommend that, that, that the researchers look at the biological mechanisms is this affecting brain processes? And is there a gene environment interaction? Are there certain genetic findings that predispose a child to develop worse outcome when they have certain exposures? And is there a potential for community-based parent education study? So um, I'm gonna stop my screen share there and I would think that a lot of you probably have not heard of a lot of this research. So I imagine that there are a lot of questions and I'd love to open it up. And again, I wanna just share that my heart is in the research to help the children that are struggling the most. And that I, as a mother of a, a, an adult with autism, a self-advocate who I'm incredibly proud of, that I am so appreciative of so much that everybody is doing to make this a neurodiverse, acceptable world. And, um, we're, but a lot of people are, are affected more significantly with autism. And if we can help them by studying some of these factors, I hope that we can, if we, as Dana said, if we can help one family, that's amazing. If we could help a lot of families, 
that would be incredible. So I'm going to open it up for questions. And, and I see in the chat, Dina, do you want to moderate or do you want? I'll help moderate, Dr. Heffler. Oh Thank, Thank you. So um, first, I want to get to Tamar, one of our moms. She has her hand raised first. So Tamar, go ahead. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, Dr. Heffler, thank you so much for your wealth of information. I, I really appreciate it. You, you're, I can tell you have a lot of heart and a lot of passion in this um, industry, and thank you so much. My daughter is 16 years old, and she was diagnosed with autism a little bit later, about 10, 10 and a half years old. And um, I do have a, a little bit of a lot of regret when she was younger, I did sit her in front of, uh, um, in front of the TV quite a bit. And instinctively, I knew I shouldn't have done that. And at the moment, I was just trying to, I guess, get a, a babysitter so I could do my, um, I worked from home, I was a realtor at the time. Um, however, when I had my son six years later, and he's, he does not have autism, I, I learned from that. And I saw, I saw by the time he was born and she was six years old and I could tell something was going on, I knew not to do that. So with him, he had no screen time at, until after two years old, because by then the, um, the American Pediatric um, Association had stressed that. And so I paid attention to that. And I do see that he had his attention span is a lot um a lot longer than hers. He's, um, he's, he was more interactive. He is more interactive. He's 10 years old now. And I see quite a bit of difference. So I, um, I, I have regret, but I, I did learn my lesson with him. So I guess my question is, if, if we did do something like that, is there a way to, uh, I can't, I guess you can't reverse it, but there's there ways of, of helping the child. I mean, once you've, you've done the damage, I mean, what can you do to help the child as they get older? Well, first I wanna say that I can tell you're an incredible mom. Oh, thank you. That everything that you have done for your daughter is helping her. Um, and we never wanna go backwards because we don't know what would happen with any child with a different environment because it is so hugely genetically determined. Um, if children are young, and so I did present two of the intervention studies and they found that turning off the screens completely um, and doing a lot of social. So it's not just turning off the screens because children, like I, pre I presented that one study that children don't sort of respond to the social. So there are specific strategies to get a child's attention when they're young, when they don't attend to social. So positioning yourself really low so that you can get eye contact with the child, being really animated to get the attention towards you, holding things up to your eye to again, promote that eye contact and joint attention when a child is young. Um, at, but I do wanna stress that we, causation is not, has not been studied. So we're not saying that this causes it. We're just trying to help people have the best outcomes that they can. And um, so there is a study that shows that in typical children that went to an overnight camp for a week and they were away from screens that they came back after that week and compared to the children that remained on their screens like normal, they had much better ability to read faces and understand social cues. So at any age, I, it may help to just engage socially as much as possible, um, but that at, for a, a child that's like 16, we wouldn't say, because I don't know how she uses, because at that point they may use screens a lot and it may benefit them that that's how they may interact with people. Some people use communicative devices and that's how they you know, communicate. So we don't wanna take anything away from anybody. Um, but if you want, I don't know what she does now, but if you wanted to do a trial of maybe, I don't know how much time she has, but if you're not following the American Academy of Pediatrics, which, excuse me, I'm sorry, but, um, is two hours or less of like non-schoolwork. 
if if you're if she's doing more, you may want to try to cut it down and see if you notice a difference. So what? So we have an intervention study that I can't really talk about because it's going under review and and maybe Dana will invite me back and I can talk about that study after it is published. Um, but Dana, if there's anybody that has very young children that you know wants to talk with us, we will help anybody that we can. And I'm happy to talk with you privately as well. I mean, I don't, I never, you know, charge or anything like that, but um, to maybe go over some strategies if you, you know, wanted to consider. I, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, that was very helpful. Thank you. Um, I, I think you're right. At any age, it would help to lessen the screen time. So because of uh, just her her friend was not being a good influence. We um, it actually turned out to be a good thing. We took devices away from her for a whole week, and I noticed she was more alert and more engaged with us. So I'm like, hmm, we gotta do this more often. Yeah. And she does cross country now. She just started school, eleventh um, grade, and so yeah, she's so she's really active. She's really active, and she loves running. She loves running. So I think she found her niche. But I think that was it. The that she was on her phone way too, way too much and it was affecting her. Well, I hope that, I hope that it can be a positive for her and I'll be a resource if you want. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'd love to reach out to you. Maybe at the end, you could put in the chat how to reach out to you. So thank you very much, Dr. Hepler. Thank you. Thanks, Tamar. That was such a valuable conversation. Um, Jeff, you have your hand raised. Go ahead. Well, I think uh, after listening to this um, presentation that, um, and, and I noticed that, um, you know, something personal that I find going along with it is that my sister and brother-in-law who live in, um, live in Virginia, and actually my sister's a graduate of Drexel University, by the way. Um, so, but is that they don't want, they don't allow my nieces, their daughters to watch television of any kind. Which is very, which is very true, given you know that how the media is these days. But I think maybe um, some, maybe allowing like maybe one hour of television a day for children is, I think, appropriate. You know, with you know something educational like um, Sesame Street or Mister Rogers' Neighborhood, or and then maybe maybe that way, just something that they can learn from, and then they can take what they learn. It's Think of, think of watching like one hour of television is like, you know, what, it's like, you know, going to school for one hour, you know, learning basic, um, learning basic, you know, human techniques could be something that might be beneficial, you know, um, just something that, you know, that the child can learn from. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point because, so when children are over three and some children over two, that they understand what they're seeing on a screen, that educational programs can be really helpful to learn early sort of preschool, pre-kindergarten skills. Um, we're mostly concerned with the children that they don't understand what they're seeing. So they're sort of processing in terms of light and image and movement and color, as opposed to understanding that this is a social interaction and that that person is teaching them. And, you know, they, so you're absolutely right. One of the ways um, to sort of help children to learn um, is to show them educational programs, but very limited. So it's supposed to be limited to an hour or less of really high education, two years or old, two years to five years. And we recommend, this is recommended actually by the American Academy of Pediatrics, that the parents co-view and ex help to explain what the child is seeing. So that was a really great point. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. And uh, yeah, and again, this is coming from the uh, brother of a Drexel graduate. So Mm -hmm. I love it. There's so much pride in our East Coast connections. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Um, the educational component, I'm glad that you brought that up, up, Jeff, because we have another question from another parent, Judy. Um, she said, for an older elementary age child, um, 11, 
what is the best school learning environment, especially considering that many school programs today emphasize technology and lessons with screen time. So do you have any comments on that, Dr. Havler? I mean, I always feel that in-person teaching is the, the going to be the most beneficial because again, the joint attention, which isn't as critical for the older children, but I think, you know, it's, you can, the social connection drives learning. Think about how we loved so many of our teachers and it wasn't just what they were teaching us, but it was because we cared about them as people and we maybe looked up to them and that's so much easier in person. It's been a huge challenge during COVID um, and, you know, especially the first year when schools were shut down and, and students didn't have those options, but hopefully going forward, it'll be more in-person learning. Absolutely. Um, and just a comment uh, from Karen. She says, Dr. Hepler, I want to applaud you for your eye-opening presentation and the extremely valuable work you are doing. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Um, oh, Jeff, you said parents can also obtain DVDs of educational programming on sites like Amazon because it's very hard nowadays to find the right programming on normal television. Good tip, Jeff. Thank you. Sandy, I see you have your hand raised. You're on mute. I'm going to, there you go. Okay. So Eric is almost 34 going on 13, <laughs> but when he was nonverbal, I discovered he was a visual learner, but we had those educational programs, Sesame Street and whatnot, but I was right there interacting with him when there was singing and things going on on the TV. Then I was also acting out with him. So he'd look at the TV, he'd look at me, he would see that action. And then uh, at, if there was another time when he would watch that educational thing, um, he would focus on that and I'd see him doing these activities and then I would videotape him. And so then I would play back those videos to him and say, oh, I love how you did that. I even videotaped the meltdowns and I gave credibility to, you were really upset there. What was going on? When he did become verbal and we went through all those videos, he could tell me what he was thinking. And that became a very valuable tool that, um, and, and he's since used those for speaking gigs, but being able to say how he felt at that time and what was kind of going on is in his head so that, um, you know, I had to try to figure it out at the time. But I, I thought that, um, well, and that was back in the 1990s, so there weren't any programs and I was just trying to figure out what to do with this kid but I did not want him to be isolated and me doing something else so I interacted with him and we we still do that and we don't have the um, tv on we're still kind of goofy <laughs> but he is a runner he's a runner so. well that's that's beautiful and using things to enhance your social interaction with him is beautiful. Yeah, and, and that has, um, and I could also point out if there were characters on the screen, uh, their facial features, you know, what are they doing with their, you know, with their eyes, with their mouth? What's, you know, does this match that? And trying to put that social uh, piece in there and help him find cues. And somebody asked him one time when he was doing a lecture, um, when you walk into a room, you know, what are you thinking? What do you do? He says, well, I first look around to see who is approachable. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, he sounds incredible. He sounds on incredible. The and all the things that you have done have clearly helped him. Well, and like I said, you know, his sister was not a warm and fuzzy person, so she pretty much just leave me alone. Um, but when I could get them engaged together and videotape them, mm -hmm. then I could also talk about her reactions to try to soften some of that 
sibling yeah. angst. Thank you for sharing, Sandy. I think that was a great way to practice joint attention. Yeah. Turning a passive activity into something that's very active between you. And that's a great like family thing to do, I think, that people can implement. Um, for it also, it also helped me find uh, how to calm down some of his, uh, what triggered him if he wasn't happy about something. Yeah. And then and then to find um or to to say to him, well, I see I see you're unhappy or you are happy or give give credibility to his emotions so that he would think that I understood him. And that was for him, that was a calming thing. He would kind of stop screaming. <laughs> <laughs> So valuable. Um, thank you. I think you're such a wealth of information. And thanks for joining us today, Sandy. Thank you.